Okay, we are recording. Good. Hello, Good everyone. everybody. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulties. Welcome everyone to uh, this forum on reproductive rights. Country Coalition welcomes you, and I think pretty much everyone has been to one of these forums before, so we can get on with the program pretty quickly. I would like to introduce the panelists tonight. Um, we have two, uh, and uh, I'll get right to it. First, we have Representative Deborah Altschiller, um, who is a two-term member of the New Hampshire House of Representatives, serving on the Judiciary Committee where the majority of reproductive freedom bills are heard. She works as the community liaison and trainer for New Hampshire's largest domestic and sexual violence crisis response center and violence prevention programs. She is a trainer for the New Hampshire Human Trafficking Collaborative Task Force, working with law enforcement, medical professionals, and the National Guard. Additionally, she serves as a governor's appointee to the New Hampshire Oversight Commission on Children's Services. And our second panelist is Kyla Montgomery, who is the Acting Senior Director of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund. In her previous role with the organization, she was the Director of Advocacy and Lead Lobbyist, helping to set the policy agenda for the organization. The New Hampshire Public Affairs team works on organizing and educating supporters of sexual and reproductive health in our local communities and campuses. Kayla has been with the organization for five years and before that worked in various electoral and government relations places. So with that, I think we can get right to the program. And which of you would like to go first? Okay, uh, I think I'm starting. Um, and I do have some slides. I don't know if you're able to bring those up, um, but if not, it's no big deal. Um, can you screen cap Kayla and, and put them up yourself, or do you want us to try and put them up? If you could make um, Kayla a host, a co-host, then she can put them up. Okay. I will do that. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Hold on. Hmm. It's not allowing me to. Okay, it's no problem. Um, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, maybe because Tracy, you're the host now. Can you see that? Okay. Um, yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually I was able to do that, so um, I'll just go from here. Um, let's see. Present it. Kayla, if you make it a slide, right. there we go. Okay, yeah. Kayla, you're okay. your co-host now. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, so just let me know if you can't see anything or if we go if something happens, just um, flag it. I can't see the comment thread when I'm the co-host though, so um, if someone else can just interrupt and say that there's a question in the uh, comment box, that would be really helpful. Um, yeah, let you know. Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks for the introduction. My name is Kayla Montgomery. I am the um, Senior Director of Public Affairs at Planned Parenthood New Hampshire Action Fund. Um, we also, I also represent Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, although I do not represent them tonight. Tonight I just represent the Action Fund. But I think it's really important for folks to be aware that we are um, two sister organizations. So Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, ppn &E, um, that is our 21 health centers throughout Maine, Vermont, and New Hampshire. There are five health centers in New Hampshire, and they're Claremont, Derry, Exeter, Keene, and Manchester, and about half the patients that we serve at White River Junction are also Vermont residents. Um, and so that is a 401, uh, 501c3, doesn't engage in any um, electoral activities. The Action Fund, which is um, the hat that I am wearing tonight, is where we do all of our advocacy and our um, electoral and our education work. So we do all of our organizing. That's the pink side of the organization. Um, and then we also have a PAC, uh, which is not really very important um, because that's just simply electoral. Um, so we actually, our um, 2019 um, annual exam just came out, um, so I'm happy to share that in the comments um, when I can, because it's a really uh, detailed explanation of everything that Planned Parenthood of North New England has been doing or has done in 2019. 
Um, we know that the 2020 uh, um, report is going to look a lot different. Um, but in 2019, um, in New Hampshire, we saw over 13,000 patients. Um, and you can see the breakdown of age distributions. Um, we're also seeing a lot more men these days. We've seen um, last year we saw more than 10% were men. Um, and uh, that's really important because uh, we certainly offer all kinds of services um, for men's care as well. Um, and one important note is that 70% of New Hampshire patients were low income. So everything we do is on a sliding scale and you can just pay for what you can afford. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about sort of a broad picture of what would happen if Planned Parenthood uh, was defunded. So obviously that is something that we hear about a lot. We've been hearing about it on a federal level. We've been hearing about it on a state level and the executive council. Um, so we're talking about like what would happen if Planned Parenthood just simply didn't exist. Um, and we're seeing it already. We're seeing some really significant impacts in parts of our country around what happens when people don't have access to Planned Parenthood um, and don't have access to reproductive health care. So we're seeing the first one is abortion deserts. Uh, people have to travel very, very far in order to get the care that they need. Um, and if you have to travel, you know, multiple days or have waiting periods and have to spend the night um, and have to deal with childcare or get on a plane and fly somewhere, uh, abortion access isn't very accessible. Um, we are very fortunate in New Hampshire that we have two health centers, Planned Parenthood health centers that provide abortion care in Manchester and in Keene, and then we have two independent providers, one in Greenland and one in uh, Concord, but uh, not all states are fortunate enough to have that um, availability. Um, we also know that just like in, in general healthcare, um, if we don't have access to reproductive healthcare, what can happen? Uh, I don't know if anyone saw it today, but Ted Cruz put out some garbage statement about how um, pregnancy uh, isn't a life-threatening illness, but um, tell that to the people whose families have passed away because of uh, birth or pregnancy. Uh, the, mortal the maternal mortality rate in this country is huge and it is growing every day uh, and it's very scary and there's certain things that we can do including prenatal care um, and making sure that people who don't want to get pregnant won't get pregnant through contraception that can help take care of that. Um, so if people can't get the care that they need, the preventative care that they need, um, they're gonna face problems. Um, and of course, if it's not affordable, then it's out of reach from, for people. Um, I will pause there. Are there any questions in the um, comment box that I can address? I think I, or the chat box. The, oh, I see a few. The only one is to repeat the towns in New Hampshire with health centers, please. Sure, so Manchester is our largest health, is PPNE's largest health center. Uh, that's our the flagship health center and they provide abortion care there um, and then the other ones are Keene, claremont Derry, and exeter and those are all much smaller Keene is a little bit bigger just because that's it's right on campus or it's like right next to campus um, but uh claremont Derry, and exeter are very small and they're not open five days or five or six days a week in the same way that manchester and Keene are um, they just have uh, less hours. Um, and then, like I mentioned, in Vermont, we have um, White River Junction just right over the border, and half the patients that we see, or that PPN and sees, uh, are from New Hampshire. There used to be one um, in Lebanon, but it just moved over the border. And then in Sanford, Maine, there's one as well, which is pretty close for people who live um, in the, you know, on the border of Maine. So right now, Planned Parenthood. Um, moved very quickly during this time of COVID. Um, really like incredible work was done in a very, very short amount of time. Uh, like all of us dealing with the virus, we you know went home on a Friday and then didn't really come back to work on Monday. And so uh, Planned Parenthood Northern New England and all affiliates throughout the country were able to get telehealth up and running very, very fast and make it work for, for patients. So currently all 21 health centers are seeing patients via telehealth. Um, that is the priority. And then if we need to see patients in care uh, in person, then we do that as well. So, um, you know, the, the thing is that I think everyone on this call really understands is that 
reproductive health is time sensitive. And in the beginning of this pandemic, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, pro-life folks who were pushing for um, Planned Parenthood and other reproductive health centers to stop operating because they weren't deemed essential. Um, but anyone who has ever been pregnant and doesn't want to be or is dealing with um, needing birth control or um, is dealing with an STI, you recognize that that is time sensitive treatment and um, care does not stop just because there's a pandemic. So uh, we were able to sort of fight back that in Congress. We are now deemed essential in New Hampshire and um, care continues and it will continue um, throughout the rest of this pandemic. Um, and whatever lies ahead. Planned Parenthood has been around for 101 years, and uh, we plan to be around for another 101 years. Um, so I want to talk about the reproductive health landscape in New Hampshire. Um, and this, I think, will be really, um, I think a lot of people probably already know this, but I just want to sort of reiterate it for folks. Uh, we have one of the most positive reproductive health landscapes in the country, but that is only because of a lot of hard work from a lot of people who are on this call right now and through a lot of years of, of work and recognizing that New Hampshire does have strong bipartisan tradition of privacy uh, and we need to keep it. So what we don't have is we don't have any trigger laws. So a trigger law is basically something that says if Roe v. Wade falls in our state, uh, we'll uh, cease to have abortion care. We don't have any of that. Um, and we also don't have any pre row restrictions. There was one on the book um, that was put into place. And then when Roe came about, it was, it was null. It just didn't, it, it, there was no need for it anymore. And Jean Shaheen, when she was the governor, uh, I think it was back in 1998, she took it off the books entirely. So because of that move, we don't have anything that sits on the books. So regardless of what happened with Roe, um, it wouldn't change in New Hampshire because we don't have any pre-existing laws on that. There are 16 states which, like I said, have trigger laws which would automatically ban abortion if Roe is overturned. Um, and then uh, we don't have any, um, we have very few restrictions on abortion access here in New Hampshire. Um, the two big ones are that we have parental notification for minors who are seeking abortion. So that's not parental consent. You're, the uh, minors' parents don't have to agree to it, but they have to be notified. Um, and then the other one is that um, Medicaid does not cover abortion care, um, which is a big restriction for low-income women. Um, so there are no gestational limitations on abortion in New Hampshire. Um, that is really up to providers um, at Planned Parenthood of Northern New England, we go to like 14, 14 and a half weeks. Um, every provider is a little bit different. Um, so you'd have to sort of check with hospitals on that. Um, so I can't really talk about any of that because I don't know. But um, we really have the tradition of making sure that anything that happens in pregnancy should be decided between the patient and the doctor, um, which is really uh, about privacy and that's something that I think New Hampshire residents hold pretty dear, which is why we've been able to keep off uh, limitations, uh, gestational limitations. Um, so as I want to take a minute to talk about Roe because I think this is something that, ha that we've been hearing a lot about, particularly since um, changes at the Supreme Court, the US Supreme Court. Um, we have sort of, everyone I think has said this probably at some point or has thought about it, like, why don't we just codify Roe in New Hampshire and then everything will be fine and uh, we can move on. So um, that statement is something that I hear a lot, but um, I think it's important to sort of back up and talk about what Roe, what Roe v. Wade actually means. And so I have this slide, uh, a couple things on it. I realize this slide has like a lot of information on it, so I'll just try and summarize. Um, but I think the bottom, whoop, hold on, lost it. Um, I think the bottom line here is that we need to be looking at Roe as the floor of abortion rights and not the ceiling. So um, back in 1973, when Roe was established, it was 
remarkable. It was game changing. It was incredible. But um, that was nearly 50 years ago. And uh, what worked 50 years ago for this might not be what works today. And what Roe does, and I'm not, you know, I'm not an attorney, um, but if you look at the, the law of Roe, is, uh, it says that the government has no right to intrude on a pregnancy up until a certain point. And then government has the right to intrude on a pregnancy. And so that's sort of the framework. That's where it establishes. And, you know, that's fine if you're eight weeks pregnant and you can afford and have access to abortion care. Um, but it still invites government into a pregnancy. And the ultimate goal of what we're trying to achieve is removing government from any point of a pregnancy because people who support reproductive rights don't believe that government should have any say in the decisions that are made at any point in a pregnancy or at any point in, a, in, a, in women's bodies in general. Um, and we should leave those decisions for the pregnant person and the provider to make what the right decisions for them and their families, um, period. And the government should have no say in that. So I think when we talk about, we hear Joe Biden talk about codifying Roe at a, at a federal level, and that would be really great for a lot of states. So for like the Mississippis and the Alabamas, that would be a big step forward for them. That would be a helpful thing. We would support that. But here in New Hampshire, it wouldn't do anything. In fact, it would sort of take us back a little bit. Um, because again, it still invites government into the intrusion. And then one, um, one major flag is that basically right after Roe passed, um, Hyde passed. The Hyde Amendment is, um, is a federal budget rider been going on since 1976, and it, it bans uh, Medicaid from covering abortion care. So, and the whole point, the person who established Hyde um, was racist, and it was a way to exclude Black women from getting the care that they needed. So uh, it's, the Hyde Amendment is incredibly discriminatory, and it is still in use. Uh, some states have chosen to use state Medicaid dollars to uh, override that and to pay for abortion care. New Hampshire is not one of them, um, but it's something we would certainly like to do because um, it is discriminatory, and if abortion is should be accessible to all, it should truly be accessible for all, and not just people who can afford it. So, um, you know, that's that's the major I think hurdle for New Hampshire is to get over that boundary and allow you know everyone to have the care that they need, regardless of income or zip code. Um, and now I'm going to stop and turn it over to Representative Schiller. Do you want me to um, stop sharing so you can start sharing or just click the slides um, for you? Actually, you could just click the slides, then we don't okay. have an interruption of the show. So um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Kent Street. Um, you have my heart and Planned Parenthood. I just gotta show everybody, I am a Planned Parenthood voter. <laughs> so, um, and check it out behind me. Those are always there. <clears throat> um, in, I have been in the house for two sessions. And, um, oh, there we go. Sorry. Okay. And <clears throat> I have to say that, um, that it is just as important to stop a bad bill as it is to pass a good bill. And it's really important to remember, um, particularly for those of you who are running for office and have a lot of really, really great ideas. Um, we need those ideas and we need your energy, but we also need a coalition. Um, so when you, when you get to the state house, and I truly hope you all do come join us in the state house, and I hope I'm reelected as well, um, there is a coalition of uh, supporters within the state house, within our um, elected body, who believe that it is that government does not have a role in women's reproductive freedoms in any reproductive choices. Um, so we often find that we need to be very strategic about what we're going to bring forward and make sure that we have built that coalition and not just that said, "Oh, I've got a great idea and I'm going to do this all by myself," because 
nobody gets a bill passed all by themselves. It's a group effort. Um, so we're really, really excited for all those of you who are joining us. So some of the things that are on this slide that you can see that would that were bad bills that we beat back uh, were seven different abortion bans, two attempts at repealing the buffer zone. So another person trying to put in a 24 hour waiting period, um, a bill that would shame women for choosing abortion, a fetal homicide bill. The fetal homicide bills are heartbreaking. Um, and uh, often there are a lot of women who come and testify who were pregnant and were um, you know, hit by a drunk driver and lost a pregnancy um, due to that trauma. And it is a very, very heartbreaking story. Um, and it's an awful thing to experience. Um, but on the other hand, when we put a fetal, um, fetal homicide bill in place, uh, it's going to keep ratcheting up. And the intention is that at you know, that eventually we will get rid of all abortion care in the state. Um, we have had bills that would target abortion providers so that they would, uh, for instance, have to have admitting privileges in hospitals or have to have extra certifications that don't necessarily exist or they wouldn't be able to collect in certain collect um, fees unless it was billed in a different way. There's all kinds of new and interesting ways um, that the anti-reproductive freedom groups will look to chip away at what we do have in place here in New Hampshire. Um, 3D funding bills, an extreme parental right bill, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the things that we were not able to beat back were a 20-week fetal homicide bill and a bill that would um, allow for students to get, you know, accurate and timely sex education. Um, in the schools. So in 2020, we beat back five bills and guarantee no matter what the makeup of the House or the Senate is, there will be these terrible bills that will come forward and we are going to have to expend the time, the resources, the energy and build coalitions to beat them back as much as we would rather um, be spending that energy on making reproductive freedoms even more robust here in New Hampshire. Um, so a couple, do you wanna just, oh, actually, do we have the, um, the bills itemized out? We do, so we can skip ahead to the next slide, Kayla. Sorry, do you wanna do this one first because this is the 2020 list? Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Okay. So all four of these bills came to the Judiciary Committee. When these bills come through the House, um, every bill is assigned a committee. Most of the reproductive freedom bills come to the Judiciary. A handful will go over to Health and Human Services and a couple will go over to the Criminal Justice Committee, but for the most part, they come through Judiciary. The first one, House Bill 1475, um, was defeated in the House, 194 to 91. Um, and it was um, a bill that would prohibit abortion services after a fetal heartbeat is detected. It was sponsored by two men, uh, Representative Testerman out of Merrimack uh, District 2 and Representative Walter Stapleton out of Sullivan County District 5. Um, the next one, 1640, was sponsored by three men, uh, Representatives Werner Horn, Representative uh, Fowler out of Rockingham, and Senator Bob Guida. And this would have deleted the option that minors have to seek and obtain judicial consent if they feel that, um, first, if they are seeking abortion care services and they feel that it's unsafe um, or they are unable to get to to go through with parental notification. There is a judicial bypass for those uh, young people to go to a judge. And um, again, three men sponsored it um, and we defeated that 191 votes to 102. And then we get to 1675, which is relative, it's called relative to infants born alive. Um, so it actually makes up a scenario that doesn't exist where um, an abortion is unsuccessful, if you wanna call it that, and a baby is born instead. 
And um, so we heard a lot of fantastical stories about um, babies who are born and then left to die in trays in closets or were suffocated or um, murdered on a, an operating table. It was, it, was, it was something else. And this was in the Hall of Representatives. So it was really disturbing. It was really um, kind of otherworldly to hear these kind of stories. Um, and this bill was actually sponsored by seven women in the House and two men. So men do not have a corner on trying to uh, roll back women's reproductive freedoms. Um, and then finally, the last one, House Bill 1678, um, would have prohibited abortion in, quote, certain cases. And what it actually would do, it would make pregnant women who are seeking abortion care services to justify their choice. And they would be given a menu and their physician would have to uh, check off that the reason they're seeking these services um, are approved by this prescribed government menu. And if it doesn't fit into that menu, then they may not have abortion care services. Um, and that was defeated 193 to, uh, to 101. And um, in that vote, we actually, um, in all of the votes leading up to that, it was a full Republican Democrat. Democrat split, um, and we gained the 16, 9, and 3 Republicans on those votes. But interestingly enough, we lost a Democrat in 1678. Um, and that one, that vote was, uh, that bill was sponsored by six women and one man. Representatives Abigail Rooney, Walter Stapleton was the man, Kimberly Rice, Linda Gould, Catherine Prudhomme O'Brien, um, Jody McNally, and Senator Regina Birdsell. Um, so, they, those bills um, come, will, will come back. There's not a doubt in my mind. We're going to go through this um, over and over again. And it is exhausting, to be honest with you. And it's incredibly frustrating. Um, particularly um, for me, I find it incredibly frustrating that um, I have never lived a day in my life as an American woman without having somebody somewhere trying to restrict and um, restrict my reproductive freedom and trying to tell me what I can and cannot do with my body. I'm exhausted with it and quite frankly, really frustrated. So, but I know it's coming back and we have to keep fighting. Kayla, can you move back up to, was there another, the good news section one? Yeah, one sec. Awesome. Thank you. Um, hold on. Good Back news. the other way. Back the other way. Great. So uh, it's not all bad news. It's not all bad news. So we did defeat this legislation that attempted to repeal the New Hampshire buffer zone law. Um, and we did defeat a politically motivated amendment dealing with abortion care later in pregnancy that had nothing to do uh, with women's health care, despite uh, the sponsor's um, stated intent. Um, we did pass a really great bill that actually went through the education committee at first, um, which would, and, and it's groundbreaking because it requires schools to provide menstrual products in their restrooms in the school. Um, if you're providing toilet paper, then you should be providing menstrual products. Um, you, it's kind of shocking to hear some of the pushback on that, um, but it did really elevate the conversation and um, kind of lifted the veil off of menstrual stigma and um, shaming of girls in needing these products in the first place. And one of the most important things we did, one of the most important things we did is we passed a really good budget through the House and the Senate that expanded protections for reproductive health care because we saw coming down the pike that the Trump administration would be threatening um, the Title X providers uh, reimbursements. And we put a backstop in the New Hampshire budget to make sure um, that women and um, residents across New Hampshire would be able to get the health care they need through our health care facilities. Um, we can move on to the budget. 
So um, the budget. For those of you who are running again um, for a seat in the House or the Senate or are supporting someone who is, or for those of you who are running for the first time um, and have not been through a budget season in the House or the Senate, um, it's a lot. The budget, is a, it, the budget is who we are. It's where our priorities lie. It's who we have decided we want to be and where we're going to put our resources. And it takes an enormous, an enormous amount of time, it takes an enormous amount of effort, it takes an enormous amount of learning curve um, to figure out how we're going to pay for the things that are important to us. So. The big issues are family planning funding, Medicaid reimbursement rates, HIV and STI prevention programming. We need to make sure that we don't dial those things back because we will have, um, we, first of all, we will enact a pub, another public health crisis um, and we will shut more people out of being able to receive the kind of health care services that Planned Parenthood provides across our state. Um, so I want to dial back to something I said at the beginning of my portion of the program about um, everybody kind of getting on the same page. It is very, very important that we pass and strengthen good reproductive freedom policy in the state of New Hampshire. That is incredibly important. That's why we're all here on this call tonight. It's also really important that we find a way to pay for it. The legislative session has two years. We're not sure how this particular session is going to roll out. We don't know. We're still, uh, we're still dealing with COVID and will be for a while. So there is a possibility, if not a probability, that the House and the Senate will not be able to have hearings in the State House and the Legislative Office building come January when the new um, when the new legislature comes into session and that was going to put us all in these zoom calls like this and there have been zoom hearings and some of them have been fine and some are not so fine. Um, and in the while we're doing all this, we are going to be trying to pass a really, really hard budget after we are not going to get the kind of revenue into the state that we were anticipating at all because of COVID. So um, as we are thinking about what kind of policy initiatives we want to put forward, the first thing we want to put as a, pri as a priority is in year one, the budget. We want to protect everything we have. Absolutely protect everything we have because it's going to, it's going to look really, really good for the cutting when it comes, when, when it comes time to slash things out. And then in the second year, we can move forward with some really good policy. Um, the reason I bring that up is that um, people have a lot of really great ideas and we should absolutely do them, but we also have some very, very active foes in our state. For instance, we have ALEC, who has a very big presence in our state, and that's the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, Representative Ullery is the ALEC um, rep in New Hampshire and drives that legislation. And he was on a couple of the bills that we mentioned earlier. There's also Cornerstone. Cornerstone is a group that um, will come out in force um, to put forward reproductive, uh, curbing of reproductive freedoms and they will bring all their people out. The Catholic Diocese of New Hampshire is also not a fan of reproductive freedoms and they, and they are constantly pushing out anti-reproductive choice bills. And National Right to Life, they're here, they're active, and um, they've got people who are running for um, the House and the Senate who will bring these bills up. So um, I hope that we can all keep our eye on the prize and maintain the budget that we have and try to make sure we protect the money that we have and use what little resources we have after dealing with the budget to fight back the bad bills without spreading ourselves too thin and in initiating more policy um, when we can wait in year two. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions if um, this is that time where we can wait till the end. Yep, we, we've got um, a number of questions. 
And sure. I can't see them while I'm. Yep. I'll, I'll read them out. Um, Excellent. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so I, I, um, I'm actually going to try and go relatively in order to make sure that we get to everyone's. Sure. And, uh, the first one, um, way back towards the beginning, we had a question about maternal death rates in the state, if somebody has those numbers. Um, I, I don't have them for New Hampshire specifically. Okay. Um, then we will move on. Um, and someone had a question about um, are women and um, and or providers getting harassed at the centers? Um, is there uh, is that that has happened in the past, and is that something that's going on now? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I think. If you wanted to see for yourself, you can drive by the Manchester Health Center on a Thursday morning, um, or frankly, any day of the week at this point. Um, this has really amplified during the pandemic. Um, we were kind of hoping that with social distancing, uh, people would stay home and they wouldn't harass, but apparently it's the other way around because I guess people who enjoy harassing people have more time on their hands right now and also don't really care about social distancing or putting a mask on. So. Um, unfortunately, the amount of harassment has really increased, um, both at Concord Equality and at the Manchester Health Center. The other health centers in, uh, for Planned Parenthood, at least, don't really get harassment because they don't provide abortion care. But um, I haven't spoken with um, the Lovering Health Center recently, but they're really far off from the road. So um, it's not like in Manchester and in Concord where you can all be very close. So we do have something on the books in 2014. We put a buffer zone um, on the books, but unfortunately um, it is not in effect right now because um, they took us, the opposition took us to court. It's been like a whole thing. And then we've been going through some renovations. So um, we're unable to use it, but um, it's a really important tool in the toolkit in order to try and stop some of the harassment, but it's definitely increased um, I am on the phone with the Manchester police way too often, unfortunately. Um, they do things like they take like, statues of the Virgin Mary and they put it in the middle of the sidewalk and they try and block. Um, it's really unfortunate because um, they really target people who maybe English is a second language or who don't speak English at all. And they say like, oh, no, this isn't Planned Parenthood. You want to go down the street. And then they bring them to a crisis pregnancy center, which is um, not real health care. It's deceptive health care. Um, so uh, it's definitely a problem, and if you're a Manchester resident, you should call the mayor's office to um, express your concern about it. Or if you're a Concord resident, you should do the same, um, because you can see them on Main Street um, pretty often. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, who, who were the women who were on the wrong side of HB 1675, the Born Alive Bill? Um, so the, do, uh, I, I fear, oh, if you have that, I'm unmuted. There we are. Um, so the sponsors of HB 675 were Catherine Prudhomme O'Brien um, out of Derry and Janine Nodder from Merrimack, um, Kim Rice, who's in Hillsborough County, Representative Linda Gould, um, Representative Abigail Rooney, Representative Phyllis Katsikoris and Deborah Hobson. And there were two men, Glenn Cordelli and Jordan Ullery. I also believe we lost three Democrats on that, and I think two were women, but I don't know them off the top of my head. Thank you. And oh. um, would you want to talk about um, Governor Sununu reportedly wants to try again to appoint Gordon, Gordon McDonald to be Chief Justice. And um, would you like to, would you like to comment on that? Gail, you want to go first? That's a big no. <laughs> That's a big no from <laughs> the hand motion. You might have something no. to say. <laughs> um, yeah, this is really important. Um, so a year ago, um, Governor Sununu nominated A.G. McDonald, uh, who has a really long history of being hostile towards abortion rights. And um, Chief Justice of the New Hampshire Supreme Court is a really big deal. 
Um, we know from across the country, we know that um, legislative, in the legislative uh, branch, uh, it is becoming more and more difficult, and the judicial branch might have to be our backstop, our backstop for a lot of these things coming up. Um, can you go with Sadie? Thank you. Um, and so, uh, so uh, we have to make sure that, frankly, a litmus test is, is important. Like, we cannot have people who don't support access to safe legal abortion be at the highest level of our court. And we know that he's keeping it open because he definitely wants to appoint um, uh, McDonald to that. So uh, we fought it and we were really, a lot of people came together to fight this last year and we were successful, but we have to keep going because uh, we know that that's going to come up again. And so um, that's why the executive council, not to get electoral um, because this is an electoral issue, but um, we must uh, have a uh, executive council who supports um, abortion rights and making sure that uh, they only nominate judges who have this, who agree. Deb, do you, did you want to follow up? Yeah, all that. She's over here to my right. I don't know where she is on all your screens, <laughs> but all of that. Um, I, I took a glance in the chat and I also saw like uh, asking about explaining the role of the executive council. And this is exactly um, why that's important. Um, for Planned Parenthood, and this is this is one of those reasons. So two big reasons. Number one um, is that the Executive Council is going to vote on those judicial appointments, and if we have an unfriendly Executive Council, then we are going to we're going to have someone on the Supreme Court who is going to go for all of these bills that I just talked about um, once they go to court and make sure that uh, women start losing their freedoms uh, one by one by one. So that's the first reason. And the second reason is Planned Parent the Planned Parenthood contract has to be approved by the Executive Council. And for those of you who remember when um, Governor Sununu was Executive Counselor Sununu, he really played around with women's reproductive freedoms and with healthcare in the state of New Hampshire when he opted not to, to postpone voting on um, the Planned Parenthood contract because he wanted to investigate um, the phony um, videos that were put out by um, I'm sorry, Kayla, you might remember the name of the group. O'Keefe is in it um, that put out the- Veritas. Vera, Project Veritas, yes. They're not winning any Oscars. So when Project Veritas put their, um, put their videos out, um, it allowed for um, conservatives to hide behind doing the right thing. And um, that's, what, that's what Sununu ended up doing. So um, another reason why it's really important to have um, a friendly executive council. Okay, and um, Cindy, Cindy Warmington, I was just wondering if you um, wanted to talk about this a little bit as well. Um, well, thank you. I think one, one other uh, area that we know uh, where the executive council will make a difference is um, as Kayla pointed out, um, there's going to be some efforts to reallocate funds post COVID as there's a budget shortfalls and those reallocation of funds do come before the executive council. So we need to have executive counselors who are going to protect um, Planned Parenthood and protect uh, reproductive rights when, um, when uh, opponents are trying to reallocate funds away from those things. So um, that's a third place I think that we need to pay attention. Yeah, and then the other big one is um, commissioners, uh, and they have the power to appoint or reject those. And we can't have a commissioner of HHS who doesn't believe in birth control or something like that, or uh, an education commissioner who doesn't believe in public education. Um, and so that's why it's another reason it's uh, important to have. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Gail had a question, would you say again the name of the ALEC person? It's Representative Jordan Ullery, U-L-E-R-Y. Oh, I see, Timothy Horgan answered that in the chat. Um, I think the other questions have been answered, but um, if not, post it again now, <laughs> last chance. 
Tim Horrigan has one about, about Planned Parenthood putting up a buffer zone signs yet. But there's also, do you see that question, Kayla, there? I do, yeah. Um, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's a little bit, it's a little bit tricky. It's a little bit nuanced. Um, we sort of came, we said to, when we were litigating this, and we said to partners that uh, we would not go ahead and put up a buffer zone as the first thing. We have to do some things in order to sort of compromise, like maybe we could um, put up signs, maybe we could put up a bigger fence. Like there was lots of different things. We can work with police more. Um, and so also, you know, we know that when we put it up, we're going to go to court. And uh, frankly, at the moment, we don't have, um, you know, that's a lot of money and time. So there's sort of like little incremental steps that we can take before we go back to using the buffer zone. But the important part about the buffer zone is just, it's an incredibly important tool that we need to keep on the books because the way things are going, it's only getting worse. And so there might be a day where we need to immediately put it up. Um, and then we know in other cases, in other states, there's been a lot of litigation around um, around at Massachusetts, struck it down at the, at the Supreme Court. So, um, you know, it's just, it's difficult to litigate in, especially right now. And, but it's important. And, um, you know, we, like I said, we're seeing an increase um, in protester activity that um, something really needs to be done. It's, it's, it's not great out there right now. Uh, there's a, uh, Jane Van Zant has a uh, question also, but what percentage of, of Planned Parenthood of New England is actually abortions? Sure. So um, the overall stats for all three states, 6% uh, of our services is abortion care. So the majority of it is contraception and um, general exams. Hey, good. I think that about wraps it up, everybody. This is uh, the last of our um, events, unless we can. Uh, hey, Rob, can I? Racial um, justice one. Yes, Deborah has a final yeah. One thought. more, one more thing. Or if two Keela, final thoughts. Yeah, one more thought, uh, Keila. Do you mind putting up that last slide about language matters? Oh yeah. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I want yeah, to. I I wanted really to time yeah, I just wanted to, uh, for Keila to put this up because I know how active Ken Street Coalition is, and I see a lot of. Um, in the participants list, I see a lot of activists. And so as you're getting ready to write letters to the editor to do social media posts, it's really important to use the language um, that we're all on the same page with the same language. And so there are some language choices um, on this slide. And I think, Bob, did you mention, Rob, did you mention that these slides are going to be available to the participants yes, uh, at another time? Up, uh, okay, great. The slides tomorrow, I'll, I'll put them out to everybody. Right. So um, if you notice on the left hand side, you've got um, the the language that we want to avoid. And the reason we want to avoid those that language is that's the language of our opposition. And so if we let them frame the conversation, if we let them drive the narrative, then we're always in defense, right? So we want to make sure that we're talking about reproductive freedoms and reproductive choices in a way that reflect it's a medical decision, right? Um, so it's a decision, not a choice. It's safe and legal reduced rate of unintended pregnancy versus reducing abortion and keeping abortion rare. Um, use unintended pregnancy versus unwanted or unplanned. So. Um, as you reflect on these, after you take a look at them later, um, try to incorporate these in your messaging um, so that we're all on the same page and we're driving the narrative in a productive way. Thank you. I appreciate the, the indulgence. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. And I, I'd say if, if you take two things from this slide, um, the first one is um, late term abortion. Don't use it because that is not a thing. That is not something that happens. That is what they want you to think. So instead, we're talking about abortion later in pregnancy. Late-term abortion does not exist. And then just to try, really try, try hard to avoid any language that stigmatizes abortion. Abortion is healthcare, and it needs to be treated as such. It should not be carved out from anything. It is healthcare. Hey, great. Thank you, both of you. Thank all of you for uh, your participation in uh, these uh, 11 and maybe a 12th later uh, Zoom conferences. We've had fun putting them on, and uh, maybe we'll keep do this every two years. Uh, we'll have to see how that 
how that works out. But thank you for coming. Thank you to Kayla and Deborah. Uh, that's great. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks, Gail. Thank everybody. And we'll Thanks see you at the polls me. on Tuesday. Although I hope all of you have already voted. Take care. Oh, yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.